A very good afternoon to all of you from the entire family of Doplexes. We are back with another session which carries a dire importance in the overall well-being of children these days. Studies have shown that uh, in India alone, out of 24.5 million births per year, the prevalence of clefts is somewhere between 27,000 to 33,000 per year. Now imagine the plight of these families whose children are born with such major anomalies. Not only it affects their physiology and health, but also affects their quality of life in all aspects. But with the advent of surgical repair of clefts, which has been nothing less than a boon to the modern medicine, millions of children are now living a normal and a healthy life. So today's discussion is centered around the latest advancements in surgical uh, repairs of clefts. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce you all to our speaker for today, who also happens to be my mentor and a very dear friend during my days of training. Dr. Akshay Daga is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon with over 14 years of experience in the field. Apart from being a phenomenal surgeon, he has strong inclination towards academics and has imparted various lectures in national and international conferences. To his credit, he has many national and international papers published. With special interest in cleft trauma and orthognathic surgeries, he is associated with cleft centers like Smile Train for more than six years now. He is currently working as a professor in SKDS Dental College, Nagpur, and is the owner and director at Glam Smile Multispeciality Dental Hospital, Nagpur. And he consults at various hospitals as a consulting surgeon. Welcome, Dr. Raksha. It's a pleasure to have you. I would now request you to please start the presentation. Very good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we are going to discuss a topic which is very close to my heart. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've been associated uh, with cleft surgeries as such during my post-graduation days and say around 12 years after that. William H. Dawn once said that when art and science meet, then great works can be accomplished. What better examples than cleft surgeries of this particular saying? Cleft surgeries does not only require the knowledge, it also requires skill gained out of experience and the dexterity of your hands to have a perfect synergy for the best results possible. Always remember, the child who has a cleft lip or palate has not done anything wrong. It's not an accident. It's not like tobacco chewing or uh, having a cancer where you can say that, okay, it's because of my mistakes that I have been, uh, you know, blessed with such uh, or not blessed, unfortunate to have certain anomalies. This is something which is congenital, which the child does not have any control of. So today, a descriptor. A descriptive epidemiology is not required. What is required here is to know that a child is born with a cleft somewhere in the world approximately every two minutes. 27 to 33,000 clefts per year. That's a humongous number. And we need, because these are 27 to 33,000 children who are going to have an abysmal quality of life if the surgery is not done at the right time and at the right place with the right surgeon. Okay, so what are we covering today? Now we have had a, you know, a barrage of uh, webinars and seminars for the past year and a half during this lockdown, where we have been, you know, bomb blasted with a lot of theoretical aspects. What I'm going to do now today is I'm going to cover only the cleft lip, unilateral cleft lip timings, landmarks, planning, incision and repair, a little bit about bilateral cliff lip if time permits, and nasoalveolar molding and its benefits. Now, what I'm going to do today is not discuss the theoretical aspects, not discuss the embryology, anatomy, classification, clinical features, no. I'm not going to discuss all of that, presuming that you would have a little idea about that. Because if we go into the theoretical details of cleft, then I think, I will require like four hours to only complete cleft lip. What I'm going to discuss today, which is more interesting, is like more of a practical lecture where I'm going to take you through simple photographs and a couple of videos through which we are going to see how exactly 
the surgery is conducted. First and foremost is the timing of the repair. Now that is extremely important because we need to understand when do we need to do the surgery. So at approximately, we all know that approximately fourth, fourth to eighth week of gestation, there are some issues because of which the cleft happens. I'm not going to go into the embryological details. Earlier, it was said, now this PNAM, which you can see here, is the primary nasoalveolar molding. I'm going to discuss about it uh, in detail a little ahead, along with a video. And why is it important for us to know this when we are treating any lip or palate surgery? Primary cleft repair. You know, primary lip repair, there was a symmetrical outcome of nose and keloplasty is done approximately, keloplasty is the surgery of the lip, is done approximately between third and the sixth month of life. Now, this is slightly delayed from the earlier third to fourth month, which you might be seeing in, you know, a lot of books such as Bardashes or uh, Milaj, which are the holy bible of uh, clefts. They advocated that it should be done at three to four months of age. But now we are doing it at approximately six months of age. Now lip repair during the first 48 hours was also conducted in say around 1990 by this Thai et al on 300 children. But actually it, they found no evidence of a fantastic result. And there was also seen to be potential harmfulness of surgical trauma in such young children. The concept of adhesive operations, that is lip adhesion, was popularized by Millard. You don't need to go into the details. I'm just going to tell you that it was one small surgery which was performed at approximately one month of age. Now that necessitated that the chiloplasty becomes a two-stage treatment, which we can completely avoid by doing a non-surgical intervention, which is called as NAM. The precious to optimum timing, which was given since 2001, is the end of six months. Latest study to support it. Now, there's a little bit of controversy approximately by the time and according to the time, say three months, four months to six months. But in India, we are following this concept of approximately fifth to six months. Now, that, because, that is because early reconstruction of lip inhibits development of premaxilla which has been proven statistically and we don't want that because we are looking at a holistic approach. We are not only looking at the reconstruction of the lip. We are looking at the reconstruction of the face along with its growth potential. Coming to what is normal. Now, I think everyone knows what a normal lip, the filtrum column, the alar rim, the nasal sill looks like. Okay, now this, these terminologies are important. This is the nasal sill. This is the alar rim. Now these are composed not of any bone, but only of cartilage and skin. And that is why it is imperative for us to be extremely meticulous about treatment of these cartilages because they are very amenable. They are very malleable. If we do not have the correct sutures at the right place, then our surgery might not be as effective aesthetically or functionally later. This is the filtral dimple. This is the cupid's bow, which becomes very important for us to recreate because this is where the aesthetics of the lip lies upon. This is called as a vermilion. And there is, and if you can see, between the skin and the vermilion, there is a slight amount of whitish color which you can see. This is called as the lip white roll. Now, if we, why this small white roll has considerable importance is because when we are suturing and the white rolls do not match with each other, then there, the discrepancy can be seen very vividly. What are the goals of repair? Placement of dislocated parts into normal and symmetric position. These are given by Millard. Placement of dislocated parts into normal and symmetric position. Elimination of unphysiologic tension and pressure. Now, there will be certain physiological tensions and pressures which are there because of the prevalent musculature around the mouth. That is the orbicularis oris and the alec and the other muscles which are around the mouth. 
we are talking only of elimination of unphysiological tension and thirdly and very importantly is to stimulate bone growth in hypoplastic areas of the maxilla now we would think why would a lip surgery be related to the stimulation of bone growth well it is extremely important because we will see later that lip surgery is not only a cleft lip we have to understand the deformity to know it better okay now understanding the deformity does not require you to know the classification i have given you photographs in which i can see it from the front the deformity and when we see the deformity from a from behind or from below opposite of the birds eye view now you see here that we can see that the nasal sill and the nose is broadened but we cannot see if we are looking from the front we cannot see the base of the nose what we can see is here is the cleft lip now the general populace also understands this that they see this cleft lip and they understand that the cleft is at the lip this is an incomplete cleft now when we see the incomplete cleft here we see that the nasal floor is squared while we see a complete cleft we see that the nasal floor is not squared we can see a defect there oh you say it's a small defect what it's very easy you need to examine and understand the deformity even further the reasons of associated nasal, nasal deformity are the agenesis of the tissue and the mechanical stresses okay now understanding the deformity requires the understanding of the muscles or the underlying musculature if you see here you can see the orbicularis oris which is completely surrounding the mouth this is not the only muscle which is involved in the cleft lip there are certain other muscles which are pulling the cleft lip away causing what i mentioned before un physiological tension and pressure these muscles these are additional muscles which are causing unphysiological tension and pressure that is why they need to be addressed as well understanding the bone deformity you can see that the septum is slightly curved on one side this is the cleft palate which we can see which we are not going to go into detail today understanding the nose deformity this is the part of the bone which you are talking about the nasal the whole nasal structure is composed of only 30% of bone the rest of it is cartilage now this is where we are focused upon this is where we are focused upon you look at the dome the dome exactly does not look like this it is way more elongated on the cleft side compared to the non cleft side and therefore the aperture or the opening of the nostril is also very elongated and smaller compared to the non cleft side which we need to address so we need to address and we need to get this aesthetically pleasing as well as functionally working understanding the deformity when we see here and then when we see like this we can see that there is a small opening at the nasal aperture but when we look even further and understand the deformity even better this is the same patient we can see that it is not a small deformity the nasal floor is completely open here there is a big part which is open here so basically what i am trying to tell you is that you need to understand the deformity well before you start planning naso alveolar molding this is a precursor to all cleft lip surgeries nowadays followed very meticulously by a team of orthodontists at all cleft centers what does it do as it says what does it mean naso alveolar molding we are molding the nose as well as the alveolus now what has happened in cleft in cleft what has happened is that there is a defect now after that defect what happens is that the tissues are getting pulled on the other side on the cleft side right so as the child grows older the growth happens in that particular planes in that particular directions so what happens is in due course of time the 
effect becomes larger because the muscles are not attached to each other and they are pulling the cleft and the non cleft side away from each other understood so what we are doing in nasoalveolar molding is simply readjusting or passively molding the growth we are just redirecting the growth in the direction we want that is towards the cleft so that it reduces the size of the cleft inside the mouth it reduces the gap in the upper lip lifts the nose and narrows the nose which is very broad and elongated which we just saw makes surgery easier and predictable and reduces the number of surgeries now how does it work i'm going to show you a very good and important a uh, video which is uh, given by the seattle institute which is worldwide famous and that video is very easy to understand it's a 3 minute video i'm just going to share it with you Re how does it work redirection of growth of lip alveolus nose and the palate we are just redirecting the growth potential towards a area which makes the surgery easier so that if the lip is going in this direction we are just redirecting it and putting it in this direction so that it comes closer it has to be worn 24/7 even while feeding small retention plate is there rubber bands and tape are there there is not too much of equipment not too much of paraphernalia and it is very patient friendly because it has to be there for 24/7 so the patient's parents should be very easily acclimatized to the usage most importantly it is not painful because it is simply passive molding we are not doing any pressurizing of the tissues we are not pressurizing any bone any cartilage any tissue it is just passive molding we are allowing the growth to get the cleft segments together changes by orthodontist should be done every 10 to 15 days depending upon the modulation of the growth additional addition of nasal stents to lift and reshape the nose after a couple of months is also done and it helps in suckling and prevents the tongue from pushing in the cleft feeding becomes easier so everything is a big positive here and that is why nam is followed for almost all broad big wide clefts so that because of all these reasons now this is exactly how we do it in our unit there is a tape you can see this is how we do it and i will just show you a video so there is a basic there is a tape here which you can see this is a tape these are also tapes here now we cannot put these tapes directly on the skin so you can see a small patch here which is there this this is a patch outline which you can see so that the patient patient the, the patient is very small it's a young child and the skin is very very sensitive and this is the obturator kind of plate which is put inside and this rubber bands will guide the cleft segments towards each other now this is exactly where the uh video will show exactly how it is done can we play the video nasal alveolar molding or nam is a treatment option for children born with a complete cleft lip and palate. At Seattle Children's Hospital, specialized orthodontists offer NAM therapy for infants with unilateral, bilateral, and mixed clefts. NAM treatment begins as early as the first week of life and continues until the primary lip repair at approximately 6 months of age. The goal of NAM treatment is to reduce the severity of the cleft prior to lip surgery by closing the gap between the lips and gums and improving symmetry of the nose. The surgeon is then able to repair the lip more easily, resulting in a smaller scar with less tension on the lip and an overall better result. To begin NAM treatment, molds of the infant's nose and mouth are taken while the infant is awake. These are used to fabricate a custom appliance, which is then adjusted as the infant grows. Cheek pads are placed outside the crease of the nose to protect the baby's skin. A base tape is then used to help close the gap between the lips. For a unilateral cleft, the tape should be applied first to the non-cleft side, then stretched across the cleft while squeezing the lips together. The molding plate is inserted at a 90-degree angle and rotated into the mouth. 
Using one finger to stabilize the plate, two additional retention tapes are then used to secure the device in place. Parents are taught how to make the tapes so they can do it themselves at home. This is an example of two retention tapes and the longer base tape, which would be used for an infant with a complete unilateral cleft. Parents are given supplies at the beginning of NAM treatment and at every visit as needed. NAM visits occur weekly or bi-weekly. At each visit, the orthodontist will make changes to the appliance to gradually mold the lips and nose. When the gap between the gums has been reduced to approximately 5 millimeters, a nasal stent is added to the molding plate. The soft pink acrylic of the nasal stent should rest on the nostril rim to lift and shape the nose. Infants can be fussy at the first few visits as the appliance is inserted and removed. However, the appliance is not painful, it's just something new, and they often calm down within a few minutes. Occasionally, a child's cheeks may appear red or irritated as a result of taping. This generally heals quickly, but parents should notify their doctor as alternative materials can be used. Infants are often comfortable eating and sleeping with the NAM appliance in place. Seattle Children's Hospital is proud to have skilled... So that's what we saw here. We saw a very good worldwide used video used for patient education as well as for doctors. Now this basically showed how the molding is done and how the appliance is used. It also showed a nasal stent which was used a couple of months later for reshaping the nose. So what we are doing here, we are reducing, you can see here, this is our centers, right? We can see the cleft size here. We can see the cleft size here. We can see the nose, which is so broad. You can see that, which is so broad. And we can see that the nose is reduced, the broad, the width is reduced in size. We can also see a good amount of the nasal dome, which is getting prepared after the nasal angular molding. So this basically, now this, why if the cleft segments are close to each other, what is the major advantage for the surgery? for the doctor and for the patient is that again we come back to the second slide the goals of repair unphysiological tension and pressure now if we have to pull somewhere if we have to pull segments from far away then there might be some tension but if we have to pull the segments which is so close then the chances of tension the chances the chances of relapse and the chances of a scar reduce markedly. So that is why nasoalveo molding plays a fantastic role in helping the surgeon achieve greater results. See this, the amount, the amount of, when we did the nasoalveo molding, we get a good amount. See the nose, see the nose here, particularly the nose. This is a very good nose, which requires only, earlier we used to have three rhinoplasty sessions for cleft children. Nowadays, as science has advanced because of these pre-surgical orthodontics, we have now limited ourselves sometimes to even one rhinoplasty surgery late in adolescence. And that is all what is required for certain of the children, which is a fantastic improvement from at least seven to eight surgeries. We have come now down to three to four surgeries for a complete lip palate procedure which is a great result for the patients as well. Now the types of lip repair techniques, there are the loads of lip repair techniques. Rose Thompson, straight line, Pfeiffer's, Delaire's functional rhinoplasty, 
Tennyson Randall triangular technique, and then we have a gap. I have particularly put this gap to show that Millard's rotation advancement technique is one step ahead simply because approximately 80% of all surgeries done worldwide are done through Millard's rotation advancement technique or one of its modifications. Now, mind you, Millard gave this technique approximately 50 years back and barring a few minor modifications, the basic ethos, the basic essence of the surgery till today remains the same. Now, delays. Now, I'll just talk about delays. Now, you know, delays. A lot of European, Scandinavian countries follow this philosophy today. In this, what they do is it, the, the cleft lip procedure becomes a very major surgery because they use all the accessory facial muscles as well. They try to repair the accessory facial muscles as well, which in India and in the US and in the Far East is not done today because simply because it increases the time of the surgery to approximately three to four hours. And it is a much major surgery compared to the surgeries which we are going to follow now. Tennyson Randall is also followed. This is the second most common uh, technique which is followed. It is a geometrical triangular shape repair which follows the basic tenet of plastic surgery which says that a straight line scar is much more visible to the naked eye compared to a zigzag or a triangular scar. And so we have a proper triangular, isosceles triangular scar in the lip, in the middle part of the lip, which is there in the Tennyson Randall technique. Now, we are not going to go into the details. We are going to go into the details of what is followed in India, in Asia, more of uh, all, almost all of the Americas and in the Far East, and that is the Millard's rotation advancement technique. Uh, can we play the uh, video? I think I can also do that. Yes. Yeah. We'll go through the video first. The Millard repair is the most common technique for cleft lip closure. Prior to making the first incision, the lip is first marked to properly plan incision placement. Points 1 are the edge of the lip commissure on both sides. Points 2 and 4 mark the lateral edges of the cupid's bow. Point 3 is the midpoint of the cupid's bow. Points 7 are the lateral aspect of the lateral nasal ala. Point 5 is placed such that the distance between points 7 and 5 is equidistant to the length between 7 and 2. The distance between 1 and 2 and 1 and 5 should be approximately equivalent. Point 8 is made 3 fifths of the distance across the columella. Point 6 is the most superior and medial aspect of the lip skin available. Point 9 is variable depending on how much additional length is needed to drop the lip down for aligned closure. Keep in mind that the distance connecting 4, 8, and 9 is slightly longer than 5 and 6 as the rotation flap never unfurls perfectly straight. In this animation, you will see that the M and L lip flaps being discarded, though in actuality, these will be used to help with mucosal lining during closure. The red lines drawn here denote the planned incisions based on these markings. The back cut along the columella is variable depending on how much additional length is needed to drop the lip down for aligned and symmetric closure. Once the skin incisions have been made and the skin flaps undermined, the orbicularis muscle is detached on both sides from the nasal sill region. Once freed, the muscle layers are carefully and precisely closed with special emphasis along the white roll. The lateral cleft side flap is an advancement flap, while the medial non-cleft side is effectively a rotational flap. So now 
now i wanted you to all of you to have a look at those markings even after 14 years i can proudly say that i take at least 7 to 8 minutes to get those markings right i want to repeat this again i and almost all cleft surgeons do these markings even after 20 to 25 years of their practice the best example is if you have heard of dr hirji adenwala he holds the world record for doing the maximum numbers of cleft surgeries he has a center in uh, kerala which is the jubilee hills hospital and he has been one of my mentors after 30 years of clefts after more than 10000 cleft surgeries 10000 cleft surgeries yes you heard that right the number he still did his marking in the last surgeries which he did nowadays he does not do it but in the last surgeries he still did all his markings very very meticulously because it is not just a surgery if you are within those one one and a half hours or two hours you have the whole life of your child in your hands because this is something extremely aesthetically important for the confidence of a child for the quality of life after cleft surgery depends upon the aesthetic results as well as the functional results if you do a botched up lip surgery aesthetic suffers maximally if you do a botched up palate surgery the speech the function and the feeding suffers maximally so it takes 5 to 10 minutes that is why i am repeating it the third time it takes 5 to 10 minutes for these markings to be done very meticulously after that the surgery becomes much much easier so we not only do the markings on the lip which we have just seen like the commissure the cupid's bow the center of the cupid's bow this is exactly the point 5 which we are talking about which is equidistant from this commissure and this point 2 and that is why this point 5 is extremely important why because this is where we are going to start the incision and we are going to pair this soft tissue here we are going to discard or not you will see that we are going to remove this skin now so what is cleft surgery cleft surgery basically if you try to understand is why it is not closing why can't we just suture it simply like this because there is epithelium around it understand and epithelium to epithelium will not close ever this is the basic tenet of healing so what are we doing we have to remove a little bit of epithelium and mucosa from this side and from this side and then close it so that the lip can have its continuity back again now it is important because it is stretched because the non cleft side and the cleft sides the cleft sides are stretched and pulled and that is why we do not know exactly how much the distance is from here and from this commissure to the center will be that is why the markings are important to help us understand how much of the epithelium has to be discarded and which point has to be sutured to which point and that is why we go ahead with the markings again we do these markings and we get a back cut which we will be talking about this back cut is extremely important for the rotation and advancement of the flap this is the non cleft side this is the cleft side we are going to advance and we are going to rotate i'm going to show you what we go ahead with the markings this is still those 10 minutes which we are talking about the preparatory phase this is the marking on the alveolar ridge because we are going to cut a go give a good incision on the alveolar ridge the vestibular ridge on both the sides on the cleft and the non cleft sides why because we need completely adequate muscle dissection and non physiological tension so that is why these flaps should be completely free after this point 5 we go here and this is the cut the back cut at the bridge of the a uh, nasal floor not the back cut the back cut is this one this is the c flap which we are talking about sorry so this is at the base of the nasal floor of the cleft side so you remember this is 10 minutes that is why i have given 3 to 4 slides just to the markings again the markings 
now we go ahead with the marking and this is exactly the amount of vestibular skin the mucosa which we are going to sacrifice here as well as i'm sorry for the photograph but this is the area which we are going to cut and this photograph was given so that you can understand that we are going way inside the nose as well so as to release the alar cartilages so that the suturing can be done for getting the form of the nose back again okay now the vasoconstrictor which we use we are using the vasoconstrictor as a adrenaline along with saline normal saline and then we start with the skin incision which we have marked and we do the proper muscle dissection this photograph is shown to show that the muscle is clearly cleanly dissected from the skin which is extremely important because muscle closure is the most important step in any cleft surgery be it lip or palate then we go ahead and we do a vestibular incision because we have to completely relieve the lip of any pressure any tension now i am not going to go into the details of the theory i told you before this is just a practical way of step by step procedure of how you perform a millard's rotation advancement technique we go ahead and this is the advancement flap this is the flap which is the advancement flap which is going to be advanced toward this side now mila as millard said that this is the non cleft side and it has gone up already it has gone up already because of the pressures so now we need to rotate it and get it here and the cleft side we need to advance it and get it in the back cut which we had shown in the back cut which we had shown so this v shape is going to get into the back cut that is the last procedure of the surgery because we need to know exactly how much back cut is there and how much of it is needs to be advanced now you have seen one more thing that still now we have not done anything to the non cleft side we have not made any incision we have started the dissection of the cartilage in the this is the incision in the nose and we are dissecting the cartilage because we want the cartilage to also become free so that it can be pulled down rather than being elongated it can be pulled down and inwards so as to get a proper form of the nose again a lot of surgeons try and do both the incisions at similar times so as to get a pliability but a lot of surgeons who have been taught differently by different uh, schools of thought like us we do one part of the surgery because we don't want the area to be you know uh, a bloody uh, field so as to do the markings so we do the dissection we do the alar uh, uh, dissection of the cartilage we do the muscle dissection and we do all the parts of the cleft surge cleft side first and then we go on to the non cleft side Now the flaps nomenclature. I've just got one this because I will be using these flaps later. So I just need you to understand the flaps nomenclature. The M flap is the medially or the mucosal attachment to the alveolar ridge. It closes the alveolar cleft. This is the M flap. This is on the alveolar ridge. We are using it for closure of the alveolar cleft. A lot of people. dissect and discard the m flap and the l flap there are two schools of thought both are definitely correct that is why they say millard is a cut as you go technique cut as you go that means there are a lot of modifications according to the surgeons which can be done so cut as you go the l flap is the use is is the laterally uh, based flap and it is used for closure of the nasal floor the c flap there is no ambiguity about the c flap it is used for the closure and the increment of the height of the columella it is done by everyone so there is no ambiguity about the usage of the c flap the t flap is the mucosal lining of the inferior turbinate which is in the nose for closure of the nasal floor to avoid excess narrowing of the nose kya hota hai sometimes we do the suturing we uh, dissect the alar cartilage so much that we pull it a little too tightly now this flap will help so that there is no pointy nose there is no point in the nose which you will be able to see and what we do with the lr cinching as well i will try to tell you that 
Now, this is the M flap. We have to do, always remember, we have to do layered closures. That means the mucosa, the oral, and the, the mucosa has to be closed, the muscle has to be closed, and then the skin has to be closed. So the internal or the intraoral mucosa has to be closed separately, the muscle and the skin on the top, that is of the lip and the nasal floor has to be closed. Now, this is the muscle direction. This is the muscle dissection which we are doing on the non-cleft side. And we are trying to pull it here. You can see that arrow. We can trying to pull it here so as to get it approximated on the cleft side. Now, we do the vestibular incision on the non-cleft side as well. So as to get, so as to free the lips completely from the any adhesions in the intraoral area. Then we need to mobilize the flaps. We need to mobilize this flap. We need to mobilize the rotation and the advancement, both the flaps. And we have to get it approximated and see that it is closing without any tension, without any unphysiologic tension. Then after that, we, when the flaps have been mobilized, then we look into the septum. We had seen that the septum is slightly turned towards the one side. And so we can remodify the septum right now because as it is, we have opened it up. We are barely there. So why do we require another surgery for the deviated nasal septum? We do not. So we can primarily improve the direction of the deviation of the nasal septum during the primary lip surgery as well, in which we are doing a little bit of the ALR cartilage dissection and getting the nose in shape as well. So then the nasal floor, this is the closure of the nasal floor, which we are doing. This is the closure of the nasal floor. We have to completely close the nasal floor so that there is no fistula, which is developed between the nose and the oral cavity. I'm sorry for the quality of the photo, but I did not have any other. And this is not the same patient as well. You can see that the palate has also been repaired here. But the M and the L flaps could not be seen as clearly as in this picture anywhere else in my portfolio. so i'm sorry for that now the c flap inset is extremely important for the closure you can see that the nasal floor you can see that this the columella is increased in size now now this is the pointy nose which we are talking about this is the pointy nose which you're talking about for which the t flap as well as the alr cinch is going to be seen because we are pulling this part here that is why this broad width does not decrease and there is a point here okay so now i will address that later this is exactly where the muscle is getting repaired you see this is the muscle and this is the muscle and we are going to repair it we are going to close it and it looks exactly like this very clean you can see that the skin is the the lip is here the lip is here the skin is here and the muscles are closed completely with resolvable sutures then we go ahead and we look into the white roll. This is the white roll. This is the stitch for the white roll. Extremely important stitch so as to maintain the continuity of the white roll. Otherwise, it will be very unesthetic later. We see here, this is the back cut, which we are still waiting for this uh, flap to be closed. Why? Again, we are still waiting here for this suture to be done. You know, this is the back cut. This is last to be done because if it is slightly in excess we can pair the skin off so that it does not over extend this is important this cupid bow is extremely important this is what we are looking for this cupid bow this cinching we have not done we have done the t flap and that's why we get a good curvature of the nose here but we still have not addressed this pointy uh, uh, focus of the uh, LR cartilage there and the muscles there. Okay, now that is the columnar length. You see this and you see this. You see this and you see this. Lot of difference. Now, why? Because this has been pulled up. And now, what we are talking about is this LR cinch. There's a typical type of suturing which we do. We take it from inside and we pull it out and we take a small piece of gauze or any other material and tie it up. Now, this will pull this segment up. You can see this notch here. You can see this notch here. This is going to pull this segment up so that the contour is going to be uniform later, which we do not see immediately after the surgery. 
it is going to take at least two to three weeks for this contour to be formed again so that the aperture the nostril aperture is equidistant and equal in size okay now this is the v shaped incision uh, incision line or the suture line which is there so as to decrease the tension and increase the aesthetic value and you can see the amount of muscle that is why it is looking thick sometimes what happens if you do not do the muscle repair properly then there is a proper thinness i will show you another photograph there is a proper thinness here because the muscles are not approximated well which is not at all conducive because later it will show a notch here because of the lack of muscles there and this is exactly that thickness should be there this thickness should be there and you see immediately post operatively we can see that the cupid's bow is somewhat maintained back again this is the alr sin suture which is there the results if you look at this and you look at this now this is you see that the you you can see if you feel that the cupid's bow is not exactly it is almost similar but when we do look at these patients later in life we see that the cupid bow is getting maintained day by day so after a couple of years this cupid bow will have a very good definition you see this thickness extremely important for this thickness it if this area is thinner than the other parts of the lip then the patient will have a defect later you see the nose here now much better off much better off you see you don't see that pointy nose you don't see that notch here a lot of differences which are there now look at after few years this is after few years you look at this thickness this looks that it is much more right now but later in life it will get resolved it will get resolved and come back to normal better more than less always remember this and this is this photograph is for the cupid's bow which you can see very clearly defined now which you can see extremely clearly defined you look at this this is after a lot of years you can see this thickness extremely important this thickness and you can see the cupid's bow which is pretty decent the patient is pretty happy with the uh now if we have like 5 to 7 minutes i'm just going to go over with the bilateral cleft lip as well i'm just going to take 5 to 7 minutes i hope not everyone is too bored and yawning away to glory so just bilateral cleft lips uh the basic principles remain the same the bilateral cleft this is a, a incomplete bilateral cleft lip sometimes there is a complete cleft on one side and incomplete on another side this is an a prime example complete and incomplete on one side understanding the deformity the problem here you know this is one of the extreme cases this is a premaxilla part this is a alveolar ridge it is gone way beyond the main alveolar ridge so what happens is that it will keep on growing in this direction and away from the alveolar ridge that is why the lip has to be repaired so that at least the alveolar ridge can come back to the normal place and nam has a fantastic value here we need to do nam for any bilateral lip the columnla is very short the column line is very short here i mean you can't see the column line in fact the nasal tip is flat and broad you can see that because it is getting stretched on both the sides nasal ala are flat bases are displaced laterally and sometimes inferiorly and posteriorly lower lateral cartilages are severely deformed nasal floor completely absent column ala caudal end of septum and anterior nasal spine are displaced mm -hmm. inferiorly and nasal tip and nostrils are asymmetric so they are big number of problems which are there in cleft uh, bilateral cleft lip you can see this is one of the major cases where you see it is completely way beyond so to get any semblance of normalcy it is going to be a challenge we know that from the beginning itself so that is why nam becomes extremely important to guide the role of guiding the alveolar ridge the premaxilla the nasal bone the, uh, the sorry the nasal cartilages as well as the nose in the right direction see so again the same thing which we have to go which we have gone back again we see this after the lip which has been surgery so major difference you can see major difference which you can see here this has to be addressed later i understand that but at least we have some semblance otherwise if you look at a patient like this you will be able you will be very hard pressed to understand that how can we close this lip to this lip and this lip to this lip 
that is because of NAM, which we have some some semblance of normalcy there. Now the general repairs just to understand, preserve the pre-surgical columnar length and all these things, I think we have discussed later, we don't want to take too much of time. The reconstruction, this is exactly the reconstruction of orbicularis os oris muscle behind the prolabium is extremely important in this. That is why I've shown this photograph. Uh, you can see the results which are there. You might not see that this alveolar part is still there, but that is going to be another time, another surgery. Right now, we need to cover the lip first so that the suckling can begin the begin of the patient. You see the difference and the difference. He still looks like Hanumanji, but he's going to have a fantastic life when the alveolar ridge comes back again later in life. So still a marked change which you can see. You see this and you see this. You see this and you see this. You see the cupid's bow here, which is very, very cleanly seen. You see? The cupid's bow, which is very, the scars are not too visible. The nose, the structure of the nose is very comfortable. So after certain, if the procedures, the surgical procedure is done well, following all basic principles properly, you can get fantastic results later in life. Thank you very much. I think we have taken a lot of time and we have covered at least the lip. Now, if time permits and later ever, I will come back to you with the cleft palate surgeries as well. Thank you. Over to you, Unnati and Nitin. Please take care. Thank you, Dr. Akshay. That was truly a very amazing presentation. I'm sure our viewers would have taken a lot of insights from this. And uh, I understand the importance of, you know, talking about cleft surgeries because there is a, what, what uh, being in the field, what I have understood from my colleagues and everything, uh, I feel people are a lot of, you know, uh, very confused in the initial days when you're starting the surgery as to which technique to follow what procedures to follow and how to go about it. So you uh, put it in a very precise, in a very comprehensive way from start to end, which I think will help a lot, especially we have a lot of PG students on board and I think they'll benefit from this session. Uh, so we do have some questions from the audience that uh, they would want you to answer. So I would just start with the first question. So the first question comes uh, is like what types of psychological interventions that is on individual therapy or community or school based and what time from the diagnosis to the repair are most helpful for the patients who have a cleft lip and a palate? That's a fantastic question because uh, because of uh, paucity of time, I could not uh, completely cover the counseling part as well as the psychological aspects. I was fortunate enough to have my thesis done on quality of life of cleft lip and palate patients in which we had to counsel the parents first. So that is the first time when after a sonography, the patient, the parents come to know that there is a cleft. There is a big, uh, what you call a setback for the parents because it is something which is completely unexpected or slightly unexpected if one of the parent has a cleft himself because there is a congenital predilection as well. Now the counseling begins when the mother and the actually the parents are approximately fourth month into their pregnancy because the parents need to know what kind of procedures have to be done, where the procedures have to be done, what is NAM, they have to be prepared psychologically that the child is normal. There are certain areas, basically, uh, you know, the back part of uh, cleft is that it happens mostly in the rural areas where the, uh, the, understanding of the deformity is not that much we still have places in india where people think that this is a curse this is something which is uh, you know devilish uh, you know there is some black magic we have gone we have I, i've come across all these things before so that counseling is extremely important for the illiterate uh, rural populace for the literate populace yes they need to understand that a surgery is possible nam is possible we need to show them very good uh, pre-operative, post-operative photographs to understand that their child is one among 30,000. It is not that their only child is uh, the sufferer and he can live a very good life throughout after a couple of surgeries or maybe three, four surgeries where the nose, the lip, the palate, the alveolar ridge, everything can be get back to normal. So the counseling begins from the fourth month 
of pregnancy and it continues till the time the secondary rhinoplasty is done so fourth month before the child is born till at least 16 to 17 years because this requires a lot of physiological counseling psychological counseling as well as speech therapy reading counseling so that's it's basically a multidisciplinary approach where the gynecologist the pediatrician the maxillofacial surgeon the speech therapist everyone comes in before and does their job Thank you. That was, I think, a very, very precise answer to everything. And uh, it, I, I think I myself being in the field believe that, you know, more than the treatment, what is difficult for the parents is to go through that entire journey. And of, of course, if the doctor helps them, you know, with all these counseling uh, techniques and all these, you know, uh, information. So I think they'll be better prepared. That was a lovely answer. Thank you. And which brings us to our next question, Dr. Akshay, which is uh, like, what is the most effective age to begin speech therapy after okay. the repair is complete? Correct. So now we have certain, like what I told you about the time uh, timeline for the repairs. We have approximately three to six months finished for uh, the lip. We don't, the child does not speak till six months of age. The child starts speaking at approximately one year of age. Now, at that time, the palate has to be repaired. The palate has to be repaired for two reasons. One is that the child needs to feed, and the second is the child needs to speech, uh, speak. Now, for articulation of certain syllables, phonetics, it is important for the palate to be completely closed. Speech and feeding are both important, but equally important is the growth potential. So if we try to close the palate at an earlier age, then the chances of maxillary hypoplasia, that means the growth potential of maxilla reduces considerably. So we have to make a balance between speech and function and feeding and the growth potential. And that is why we need to repair the palate at approximately, approximately 10 months to 14 months of age. And after that, as soon as the palate is repaired, say after one month of the palate being repaired, the speech therapy starts initially and continues till at least the child is four to five years of age. Thank you so much. That was, I think, a very apt answer to everything. And which brings us to our last question. Uh, in your experience, is there any technique which has an edge over the other? Yes. So uh, basically... Uh, certain surgeons, like what I told you, in European, Scandinavian countries, they are, there is a Delaire's philosophy which they follow. They have been taught that the postgraduate from the postgraduate life. They have seen their masters, mentors do the Delaire's philosophy and they are very comfortable in doing the Delaire's philosophy. And I'm certain that they do a fantastic job with Delaire's philosophy. In certain areas, there are certain people, those who follow the tennyson Randall technique, which is the second most common technique. But 85 to 90 percent of all the surgeons worldwide follow the Millard's rotation advancement technique. For me, myself, according to my experience, I have seen Dr. Shamra, Dr. Krishnamurti, Dr. Adinwala, all these mentors and doyans in the field of cleft surgeries, which I have been fortunate enough to work with. They have almost always done Millard's rotation flap. Very rarely, in certain cases, they have done the Tennyson Randall. And that is what has been imbibed in me. I have been doing and trying to perfect the Millard's rotation flap. So basically, it's the surgeon's perspective. If you are comfortable in a certain technique and you can master that technique, there is no technique which is better or which is worse, frankly. But for a, it, it basically depends on the experience and the skill set and what you have learned and what you can practice very well and that you should follow. Thank you so much. And I think uh, the way you put it, it was not only just informative, but very, very interactive. And as you said, we will be really looking forward for the next session uh, on the cleft flip and the further advancements. So from the entire team of Docplexus and from the, all our viewers, I would like to thank you for taking out uh, time from your busy schedule. This was really an important topic that we wanted to bring it on the platform for the viewers. Thank you, Dr. Akshay. And and to Dr. Have Dr. You. I would like to button like and thank you and the team of Docplexus for having me over. It's a fantastic site and a very, very informative site, especially for the postgraduate students, the practitioners, as well as people, those who are experienced, because I have seen in quite a few of your seminars and your webinars that there are a lot of certain points and modalities which are discussed, which we can inculcate into our practice as well. 
so in this case uh, where you go for a very practical approach rather than more of a theoretical and you know not many people are interested in the theoretical approach but that's the usp of doc flexel that they go into a practical surgical based or a medical based approach which is fantastic for any experienced or non experienced novice uh, practitioner so i really need to applaud doc flexes for taking this initiative and getting into all medical fields uh, all surgical fields uh, in such a beautiful manner thank you very much thank you so much means a lot that is uh, such a morale booster for all of us and that is uh, maybe giving us more insights that how are we going to take things further and uh, on behalf of doc plexus i would like to thank all our viewers i know all of you are doing a really great job during this pandemic all of you all of us are together helping as many people as we can and still taking out the time to come and view this sessions because as we know that knowledge is the first step in uh, making ourselves better so thank you everyone stay safe stay connected and happy doc flexing i'll see you all soon. thank you so much